For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We gather together today for worship on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississauga, and acknowledge their stewardship throughout the ages. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Trinity on Main, the United Church in the heart of Newmarket. We light our Christ candle to remind us of Christ's light that brings hope to even the darkest places in our life. Today in worship, we will be reminded again and again that we are called to listen. This is part of the invitation as people of faith to not only speak and pray and sing, but to listen. And I will be the first to say that listening is hard. From our toddler age and stage and the years go on, we struggle to listen particularly when we don't know what we're listening for or we disagree of what we are hearing. So just for a moment, as we gather ourselves for worship, I invite you to join me in this call to worship by listening. Family of Faith, I invite you to close your eyes, rest your feet on the floor beneath you, Release any tension that you are holding. Release the tension in your jaw or neck, your shoulders, your hands, your legs, your feet. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath in and slowly let it out. The Hebrew word for breath is ruah and it is the same word for spirit. So as you breathe, imagine that it is God who is filling your lungs with energy and love. Trust that God is as close to you as every breath. Now I invite you to settle your mind. Imagine your mind as a river. Thoughts will drift into view. They always do. However, instead of holding on to those thoughts, allow yourself to let them float by and listen. Listen deep, listen far, listen wide, listen. The sound of your breath is the sound of the divine. This is holy space. Let us worship God. Often the first step to change is listening. We have to listen to those we've hurt. We have to listen to creation as she cries and we have to listen to the voice of the oppressed if we ever hope to make things right. So today we begin our prayer of confession. We will start with a moment of silence, a moment to listen, and then we will pray trusting that God is always listening to us and that God's ears listen with love. So let us confess silently. Listening God, Take what is closed in us and open it. Take what is distracted in us and settle it. Take what is hurting in us and hold it. Take any and all parts of us that create distance from you. For we are like Peter, O oh God. We argue what we do not know. We fear what we cannot see. And we almost always speak sooner then we listen. 
So open us and settle us. Hold us and forgive us. We long to hear you more clearly. We long to know you more fully. With hope we pray. And in this time of silence, with gratitude, we confess. And we pray the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Siblings in Christ, we confess with gratitude because we know that God already has heard and forgiven us. No matter what we have done or left, undone. We are held in God's hand. So rest in the good news. God invites us in. God meets us where we are. God hears our prayers and forgives us. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen.
Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected to the, by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, he rebuked Peter again. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. 34. He called from, he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain a whole world that they can profit, forfeit their life in need why why can they return for their life those who give return for their life are ashamed of me and in my words in this adulterous, adulterous and sinful generation of this of them the son of uh, of man who will also be ashamed when it comes the glory of his father and the holy angels. What? Goodbye. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to God who is our rock and our strength and our redeemer. I have to confess this week that I find this a very difficult passage. I find it difficult because of the conflict between Peter and Jesus. Peter rebukes Jesus. Now the dictionary defines the word rebuke as to express a sharp, stern disapproval, to reprimand, which all sounds very civilized. But when I think or imagine this scene in my mind's eye, I see Peter pulling aside Jesus, pulling him away from the rest of the group, and Peter speaking loudly to Jesus for what he had just said. And that, that's where I get stuck. I can't get past the image of Peter doing that. And I used to think I got stuck there because I was so horrified by the idea. How could Peter, who had only moments earlier declared Jesus the Messiah, how could he say the Messiah in one sentence and then next he rebuked that, he rebuked that same Messiah? It seems so unimaginable. How rude and disrespectful and unfaithful Peter was being. After all, he knew only, he knew who he was talking to. And as I struggle with this passage, I've more recently come to understand that perhaps it's not that I was thinking that what Peter did was so horrific. Instead, I've come to understand that what Peter did is what many of us long to do. Maybe I get stuck there because from somewhere deep inside, I get it. I understand Peter standing up to Jesus and even yelling. 
because that's not, it's not the way it's supposed to be. When Peter signed up for following Jesus, for giving his life to Jesus, he never imagined that it would come to this. Yes, you see in our reading this morning, we have the disciples, you know, those folks who were journeying with Jesus and learning from him, coming to understand him and trust him. We have them walking along the road in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus trying to discern what it is that they have come to know, what it is that they have discerned about life with him. Who do people say that I am? And you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, who often messes things up, gets it right. Peter answers, you are the Messiah. Finally, they were getting it. They were coming to understand that this Jesus, who they were following, this Jesus, who they had watched heal and inspire, he was the promised one from God. He was the Messiah. And just, just when they were coming to understand this, just when they were coming to realize what this could mean, just when they were seeing that hope and joy and life would be fulfilled, Jesus started to tear it all away. The words that were coming out of Jesus' mouth not only astonished them, but they dismayed them because these words were contrary to what they had just come to believe. Jesus was telling them that he, their Messiah, would undergo suffering, would be rejected by religious leaders, and he would be killed. Which of course is why Peter acted so strongly to Jesus' prediction of his fate. Peter's hope for the future was wrapped up with the future with Jesus. Peter simply could not imagine the Messiah, this man with power, will suffer, let alone be killed. So, so great was Peter's shock that he couldn't hear the part about rising on the third day. All he hears are the words, the awful, unthinkable words, that the hope of Israel will be killed. What would their future look like? Now the Gospel writer does not tell us exactly what Peter said when he rebuked Jesus, but we can imagine. We can imagine it might be something like, Jesus, stop it. We have seen the power you have. We have seen what you can do. We put our hopes in you. We're building our future around you. We've left everything behind for you and thought that if we followed, our lives would be secure. With all the power, the people of Israel would know comfort and security once again. Peter could not imagine how any of this might take place how what seems like to be a life of such promise could suddenly be changed and taken away. Wow, Peter's reaction does not seem so unimaginable anymore. Because if we are honest with ourselves and one another and honest with God, there are many of us who deep within our hearts have had the same conversation with Jesus. And if we have not actually voiced it aloud, we have longed to. Jesus, when I follow you, when I live my life as you call me to, why do bad things happen? Why am I enduring such pain? Why a pandemic? Why would a God of love allow my relationship and my family to fall apart? I thought when I put my trust in you, I thought when I let you into my life and decided to follow you, everything would be okay. Isn't that the cry on many of our hearts? A very real response to the pain and suffering that we all endure at some points in our life. And we want Jesus to make it better. 
We want his presence in our lives to take away pain and sorrow. We want some sort of unspoken guarantee that when we follow Christ, everything will be okay. Jesus didn't give a promise of security and power to Peter, and he didn't give it to us. He didn't say, you're right, Peter, I will make it all better. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Jesus said to Peter and the disciples and all who were gathered, if you want to become my followers, you need to deny yourselves. You need to pick up your cross and follow me. And if you want to save your life, you must lose it. And those of you who lose your lives for me will save them. In a world of building security and self-improvement, denial of self is foreign. Surrendering, surrendering of power and security in order to serve another is countercultural. And yet, that is what Jesus calls his followers to do. Each and every time we make ourselves let go of our own power and become vulnerable to the needs of those around us, each time we give ourselves in love to another, each time we get out of our own way and seek not to what we want, but what the world needs, we come alive, we are uplifted, and we encounter God. That's what Jesus means when he invites his disciples then and now to take up the cross and to follow him because only those who are willing to lose their lives out of love will save them. Here, I should be clear, I'm not talking about, and I'm quite confident that Jesus is not talking about a kind of doormat theology where we are to ignore our genuine human needs altogether and see ourselves as not only deserving of love, dignity, and respect. Also, there is no justification here for enduring abusive relationships or tolerating injustice. Rather, I'm talking about giving of ourselves in love, which is, of course, quite different than having others take from us. And that giving and love almost always includes sacrifice, denying oneself and our immediate gratification, so to meet the needs of others. One of my favorite quotes, and I share it often at weddings, is from Nicholas Sparks and his novel, The Notebook. The, mo the Notebook is a story of love and commitment and the central character, Noah, introduces himself by saying, I am an ordinary person with ordinary thoughts and have led an ordinary life. There will be no monuments built in my honor and my name will be forgotten. But I have loved another with all my heart and soul and this has always been enough. Loving one another with heart and soul means many ordinary every day with acts of care, a lifetime of small acts of kindness, small sacrifices for the sake of the other. We know that this is true with many of our relationships and most naturally we might recognize, as parent, recognize this as parents sacrificing all kinds of things in the hopes of providing for our children. But we also recognize this kind of self-giving relationship within, with parents and children, partners and neighbors. And each time we do so, each time we call into question a momentary want of our own in order to satisfy a genuine need in someone else, we experience a kind of new life. Following Jesus comes with no assurance of warm nights by the fire and a lifelong carefree living. Jesus did not tell his disciples, 
Yes, come and follow me and I will guarantee you a worry-free life. Instead, he laid it all out to them. In plain terms, he tells them the truth about life. If you follow me, there will be crosses that must be carried. You might endure suffering and pain, and if you follow me, if you deny yourselves and take up your cross, if you follow me, you will find life. You will find life. And for Jesus, finding life was about finding God, coming to know God more fully, coming to know the one who there is, who is always with us, who is there in pain and suffering and in the times that were not okay. For Jesus, finding life was about discovering that no matter what you might endure, no matter how deep the pain or how hard life can be, God would be there. God is here. And the good news of the gospel is that we are not alone. The gospel's theory of everything is the more we give, the more we receive. The more we seek to be a friend, the more friends we discover. The more we love, the more we experience love. Jesus comes and not only shares these words, he lives them, giving himself out of love for all people and creating a reservoir of life and love that far surpasses anything the world could ever offer. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.
as God's people, we come together in prayer. God of grace, for many of us, it has been a long, dark winter. As the day is getting longer, we take in a little more light each day. And with light, we catch a glimpse of hope. Hope, hope of spring and more time outside. Hope of healing and decreasing numbers. Hope in vaccines. Hope of a post-COVID life and dreams of gatherings with community, family and friends. Keep our hope alive, we pray. Give us enough light to see the wonderful possibilities before us and the new life that awaits us. God of new life, bring healing to those who are feeling isolated, lonely or hurt. For the many whose hearts are breaking for the pain in our world, give them peace. For those who are struggling with addiction, give them strength. For all who are grieving a loss, a loss of relationship, loss of health, loss of mobility or loss of direction, give them comfort, we pray. God of us all, you know us by name. You know us through and through. You know the thoughts within us. You know the prayers that lie within our hearts, sometimes too deep even to acknowledge ourselves. This time, we lift our prayers to you. Creator God, we cannot hear the trees growing, seeds pushing up from the dirt into the sun. We cannot hear a single drop of rain, missing one in the many. We cannot hear the weight of people's grief, a burden that is so often found in silence. And we cannot hear when hearts are changed, but you can. You hear it all. You hear all our prayers, and we offer them to you in faith. Amen.
has called you through the ages, the one who is love. Can you hear the one who is calling, who has called you through the We give thanks for the words of the liturgy today from Sanctified Art. I offer you this blessing. As you leave this time and place, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your spirit dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, and go in peace. Amen.